Okay, I warn you all. Uh, if you don't want to uh, be featured in the Zoom, just like turn off your camera and that's completely fine. Cool, so we can start probably, as I said, Carl, the stage is yours. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you, Sasha. So I will be talking about uh, managing the rest of the web and it seems a bit... Uh, obscure as a topic. So we'll uh, start with uh, something which is um, an article recently, which uh, has uh, been written in the Atlantic. And uh, the title is The Internet is Rotting. And there are a couple of stats in this article. Um, two millions of um, links. So the, the New York Times has been published online for uh, since 1996, so very early in the uh, in the history of the web, and there are two million links linking outside. Usually, we call that deep links, like so, no links which are internal to the to the publication, but links which are peer to to other sites. And if we take the the full scope of uh, these uh, these links, 25 percent of them have uh, rotted so what do you what we mean by rotted it means that when you click on it, it it doesn't bring you where it should be bringing you either the website is down or the the website has been replaced replaced by a spam site uh, someone uh, a domain spammer has uh, bought the, the domain name or sometimes it's even worse <laughs> you have content you would not expect to see at all uh, and it's even worse if you go back in, uh, in history, if you take the, the period, uh, the range of time, which is in between 96 and uh, 98, 72% of the links are dead. So here there's something. It, it, it should raise a warning to us. Imagine that uh, all the books which have been published uh, between 96 and uh, 98 and you take all these books and you remove and you put 72 percent in uh, in the fire and uh, there's only uh, the remaining 28 percent what does it say about the knowledge what does it say about how we consider information on the web and uh, because i'm talking about the web it's obvious <laughs> i will uh, talk about the aesthetic of the cashier receipts <laughs> I thought I was uh, on, a, on a talk about the, the web. So I will, use, I will be using the, the cashier receipts because it's something that uh, everyone knows. And I have a tendency to, uh, to kind of collect them um, with me for, for, for a long time. Uh, and they have interesting properties. And uh, we will discover some of their properties. And by understanding the cashier receipt, uh, I will jump after to uh, I will jump back to the web. So let's talk about the information architecture of the cashier receipt. What's in a cashier receipt? Like what do you see? Like what kind of in, in, uh, what is uh, so special about it? There's a title here, for example, in this one uh, we can see like uh, there's the boulangerie Bonheur, which is the name of a boulangerie uh, very close to my place. And uh, there are more on this, uh, on this receipt. There's a geolocation. So you see that there's the address of the website, there's the phone number, and these are usually parameters that you can associate with your location quite uh, precisely. So the information, there's a title, there's a geolocation. What else? There's a date, the timestamps. Okay, so it gives a bit more information. And if you start to collect, uh, if you're a bit uh, bizarre like me and you start to collect uh, cashier receipts for a long time, you discover that uh, you can, in fact, you, you don't need a, a mobile phone to uh, geolocalize your activities. Uh, you almost need just your cashier receipts and you can discover where you have been in time. You have a memory of the places you went. You have a, a memory of the things you did uh, at, at the precise time. You also notice something uh, <laughs> interesting is that uh, 
your life is very boring. <laughs> you have a tendency to go back to the same places, to buy the same thing, to to uh, to spend uh, the the same amount of money for uh, the, uh, like uh, the shopping, the grocery, the bread, and uh, and so on. So there's also a part which is the content of the, the cashier, where there's the, 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 the billing and uh, where you have the description of the articles and the items, uh, the taxes and stuff. And another piece which is on most uh, cashier receipt uh, is a unique ID. So on this one, it's at the bottom of the, the receipt. There's a, there's a long number, but sometimes it can be... Uh, it can be a, a barcode, it can be a QR code. Uh, it's a reference for the, the, the shop to, uh, for you and for the shop to, uh, to keep a track of, uh, of uh, which, uh, what did you buy? Another interesting thing about the, the cashier receipt is that it's, it's standardized. If you never noticed, I, I encourage you to take your cashier receipts in your uh, wallet and to start to uh, measure the length of the, the, not the length, the width of the cashier receipt. And you will see that most of them are 57 millimeters. And uh, some of them, you have another category, which is uh, eight, uh, 80 millimeters. And then after there are a bit of uh, some of them uh, which are a bit more funky and uh, different. This is because for this information, for storing this information, and because of the infrastructure of uh, the the market, uh, people need a standard to be able to put uh, the roll, the paper roll, in their machines. And so you can buy a paper roll from uh, someone else, put it in the in the machine from another. Uh, Place. There's also um, this uh, format 57 millimeter. You could ask uh, what is it? Uh, sometimes uh, for the standards, uh, there are things which are de facto standard, but there are things which are driven by uh, organization, ISO organization, for example. And uh, 57, it's in fact uh, a measurement in ISO uh, size of paper, which is uh, uh, C8 or C9. Uh, one of the sites is uh, 57 millimeter. Another interesting thing about the uh, cashier receipt, it's, it's a material. It's something which it's paper, there's ink on it. You can, it has its own property, the property that we know very well because it's paper and paper, we have been living with it for a very, very long time. So for us, when we use paper, we often do not realize how much we know the material of paper. Like you could write down uh, um, on your uh, cashier receipt. You could write notes. There was a time I, I was starting to uh, draft my blog post on cashier receipt that I had in a, in a cafe or things like this. Um, but there's something which is uh, very interesting too, is that the ink, which is on the uh, uh, cashier receipt, which is often a thermal paper, like the, the principle, the way they print uh, the ink on the, the paper is a, a thermal principle. This ink is not very resistant to time. It fades away. We could talk about the rust of the cashier receipt. And if you have a cashier receipts which are old enough, they start really to disappear uh, with, with its content. Uh, so that's something to, to keep in mind. For example, this one is the, the, the cashier you see it in this slide is from 2018. So three years ago, and we see that uh, it, it starts to, uh, to go away. Um, so, and paper are interesting too. They have their own property. You can uh, like uh, you can burn them. You can put water on it. I, I would be more comfortable, for example, putting water on my uh, cashier receipt than uh, putting on my phone. Um, 
and it would not destroy the, the, the cache receipt. Okay. So let's uh, finish the talk about the cache receipt. But I wanted to use the cache receipt as a way to show you that there are properties which are associated with something which convey information, which is very structured. Some of them are very even more, uh, more structured with contracts inside, uh, like for example, some cache receipts uh, are used as a guarantee and you can uh, bring them back and there's a part of the contract on them. Some of them have advertisement on it. And, and so if you, if you extrapolate a bit more of uh, this, uh, you realize little by little that uh, it looks a lot like a website. And uh, it has a lot of information which are very similar uh, of a website. And we will see after uh, how. So this article from the New York Times says that a lot of links are rotting. So what does that mean when a link is rotting in, a, in, a, in an article? But when you click on the link, it doesn't work anymore. It means on the other side, there was a website. And this website has disappeared. And there are websites disappearing every day. And we lose a lot of the things we built, we created, uh, memories. One of the, some of the websites are not maintained. Some of the web servers are going down for technical difficulties. But probably the worst thing that can happen to a website is a redesign. <laughs> so that would be surprising because mm, probably some of the people who are uh, listening today are people who have been uh, or working currently on a redesign of a website. And I hope this uh, discussion and this talk will trigger thoughts about the way to think, uh, different ways of thinking about redesigning a website or changing a website because most of the issues of the websites are due to redesigns. So if we think that we need to preserve uh, everything, do we go all the, the way, uh, like at the other end of the spectrum and we, we take as a basis, let's, try, let's archive everything. Is it easy? Is it hard? And how would we do that? In fact, it's a bit uh, hard currently to do to archive everything. And for a couple of reasons, for some of them are due to the way we design websites, the way we create websites. For example, if you use uh, a website with a heavy JavaScript frameworks, like let's say React, or which is the, the star of the moment. Uh, like uh, if you use uh, any kind of JavaScript framework where the content is built dynamically at the moment where the page is loaded in the browser. This becomes very hard to archive. And it becomes very hard to make it resilient to time. When you design a website, you need to start thinking, what would the content be in five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 50 years, why not? And do we need really to archive everything? Does it, does it like, do we need to keep all the, the cashier receipts? Probably not. Do we need to keep all the website? Probably not. But are we missing some website because we, uh, we didn't give this ability to archive some website? These two. So if we don't archive everything, what about throwing? And uh, why would we throw a website? What would be the reason that we will throw part of a website or the totality of a website? There are some uh, things which are quite obvious. For example, you can throw uh, old tweets, 
you tweeted something when you were 15 years old and you were drunk and you were seeing something gross and you might want to erase these things. You don't trace of this online. You might think that uh, an information that you put online, let's say uh, protocol of security information for uh, administration things like uh, the right thing, the right way of doing certain things is outdated. And you might want to change that page to have uh, the new information and not confuse people with uh, information which is completely outdated. How do you determine things that need to be thrown and things which uh, needs to be kept? How do you evaluate that? Think about the websites you are developing right now and think, how do you make choices on the information? And it's even worse than that is like, what you think you can throw now what would be the value in, let's say, 10 or 15 years, 100 years from now? If someone, I don't know, let's, let's be silly. If someone, uh, anthropologist, 100 years later, find my uh, cashier receipt in a box and start to study the boring sociological pattern I have, uh, about my consumption, about my movement, and things like this. Maybe it's information that would be that would become useful again, interesting again. What about the websites we are developing now, where we think mm, it's not very interesting anyway? It doesn't matter if it disappears. What about in fifty years, when you go to a uh, second hand bookshop and you find an uh, old uh, manual, uh, old guide of something of a product which has disappeared. When you find, you crawl a uh, box where you have uh, old posters of a very old advertisement. There's this uh, feeling, this emotion where you, you're happy to find these things. So what about the website? So we need to understand the web. You, you need to, to create websites which are uh, good in the moment, in the present. You need skills. This is very important. You, have, you need to develop the skills which helps you to make a business and a living about what you're conceiving now. But it's not enough. The skills will bring you only halfway of understanding the web and creating web experiences which are interesting and which are resilient in the time, which can, which can flow across uh, um, time, history, and people. We are just at the beginning. We are just understanding little by little what it means. Uh, on the picture right here, what you see is a next cube. It's the real uh, computer of the real first uh, web server made by Tim Berners-Lee, it's at the MIT, and uh, it's still there. So it, it can still boot, uh, but it's not online anymore. So we'll talk a bit about the web in the, uh, what is it, the web? Like uh, when, uh, when we talk about the web, like as a, for people who are professional of the web, what? What exactly does it mean? And what the main thing, the main idea behind the web? This is the URL, the Uniform Resource Locator. This is the key of the web. And that seems surprising because you will not spend a lot of time thinking about that when you're taking a class about, uh, about the web. You will uh, learn uh, techniques about HTML, CSS, uh, JavaScript, about uh, uh, how to design cool website and content, but you don't spend a lot of time usually on thinking about a uh, URL. And still, this is very important. Why? 
because this is the place which guides you to a content. This is the place which needs stability. And what are cool URLs? Things which do not change, okay? If you can build stability in the URL, you are 80% on uh, doing the right thing with regard to what I'm uh, saying. Try to not break web pages. Try to not break the, the address of the web page. Try to keep them around. For example, the URL for today, for this uh, talk, is uh, the URL at the meetup uh, page uh, about Le, Le Vagron Tokyo Coding Station events and the serial number. So it's not bad as it is because uh, at least it, uh, there's a unique identifier which makes it uh, um, likely to be able to be, you can share it through an email. So it can travel the information, the reference to the information can travel from different, uh, through different medium and you can send an email and the person uh, or a message and the person will receive this message and be able to directly access uh, this content. So that's cool. Now the question I have is in uh, 20 years from now, will it still be here? <laughs> will, it, will it still be possible to know that 20 years ago, I said something uh, stupid uh, during, uh, during uh, the pandemic uh, for uh, Le Vagon Tokyo. The second part of which is, uh, so the first brick of the, the, the web is the URL. The second part is HTTP. If you would be uh, in a room, I would uh, ask you to make a show of end and to tell me if like uh, who knows what HTTP is. A part of the four letters that you see in front of uh, all the URLs that you navigate to. So it's uh, the protocol. And uh, um, it's a very, if you want to have a, a simpler way to talk about it, it's a very simple tool, toolbox to work on the information flow in between your browser and the web server. It helps you to manage that. To manage that. And we will talk a little bit uh, more about it. I will, uh, I will show you uh, what is it. That's nothing complicated in HTTP. Hypertext transfer protocol seems a very uh, um, complicated uh, thing to understand, but in fact, it's, a, it's a very, very simple. There are three things. There's a syntax, so a way to write a message. There's a semantic, so each thing you write in your message has a specific meaning. Uh, and uh, so with this meaning, you can uh, associate a, a different type of behavior. And there's a timing, the way you send a message. So the, the way HTTP is working, basically you have your browser, which we call, uh, uh, in the, on the technical part, we call that a client, the website, which is a server. And there's a relation between the client and the server. The client send a request to, uh, the server and the server is replying with a response. So this is basically HTTP and we'll see a bit more code uh, about it. So this is a request. A request is super simple. You have a code, so there, there's a, a method, a method uh, that you, we see at the beginning here, which is a get, but you can have other method where some, uh, there's post, delete, put. Uh, the two most used uh, method is get and post on, on the web, but there are other methods. And uh, what you see underneath, there's a header, which is called host. So this is part of the, what I was saying, the semantic. Host will uh, designate the domain name of the website. So here, for example, uh, www.mozilla.org. And uh, on the line of the get, there's the slash en um, dash us 
slash http 1.1. So http 1.1 uh, specify the version of the protocol you're uh, requesting because there are multiple versions of http. Then there's the host we have seen it. There's the user agent. The user agent identify the browser you're coming to uh, to, uh, to to check the website. Uh, there's the accept, which is the format you will accept as a client. You say, oh, I can support HTML. I can support uh, image, uh, WebP, and in fact, every, any kind of format after the um, star uh, slash star means a, a, a bit everything. You specify also the languages you want to receive. So in this case, uh, there's the English and the French. So and there's a ponderation, there's a, a factor to say one is a prior, has a priority on the other. So if a website, for example, at the same page in English and in French, it will serve me uh, in English first and then in French. And the uh, acceptance coding, which is uh, if you, please, please, please server, if you can compress the message before sending it to me, it will be faster, compress it. So, and there are a couple of, uh, compression algorithm. So this is what the browser is sending. I simplified because sometimes the browser will send more things like cookies and stuff, but we'll not be talking about that uh, for uh, uh, today. So the server is receiving the this get and is replying. And here the server is replying with uh, HTTP 2, 200, okay. It says, oh, it's okay. I understood your request. I will reply to, uh, to it. I give a date for my content. Uh, I will say when it expires. I will say which type of uh, uh, cache control. So how long the information is supposed to be uh, fresh. Uh, and a couple of things like the content coding is the uh, algorithm uh, compression. And then you see there's the part of the headers and there's the part with the content with the HTML that you know uh, better usually. And um, this is it. HTTP is just that. It's just a protocol where you exchange text messages in between two uh, entities, the browser and the server. And the web is just that, basically. So what's happening so often, like it's a bit more complicated than that in the sense that the information which is in, encoded in the second part is more or less descriptive. HTTP has different status code. And this is very useful. It's one of your first tools to make the web more resilient, to make the web uh, more resistant to time. For example, one code with uh, two codes, which are very useful, but uh, here I'm uh, showing just a 301. So I make a request, same thing, uh, to the root of the website, get slash. And there's a response from the server, which says, oh, wait a moment. Uh, I have nothing to give you on the homepage, uh, on the root of the website, but I will redirect you to the English US page. And uh, this will be done with the code 301, which says, oh, what you're looking for is there. And it gives me the location. To think about it is that it would be like something like a shop in the street, which has moved. Uh, sometimes uh, the business has moved to another place. And on the window of the shop, you will get uh, a notice with the new address. It's exactly the same thing. The server is telling you where is the new place for the content. So you can do permanently like here, or you can do temporary, like 302, for example. So for example, you can imagine, for example, a, a slash a website, which would be a weather forecast website. And you would have slash weather slash Tokyo. And when you access this page, you expect to have the weather of today. But if you come back tomorrow, it will still be the weather of today because it will be tomorrow, but you will not have access anymore to the weather of yesterday. 
So to handle that, you could you could do a temporary redirect each time you hit Tokyo. You could redirect to the weather of today, and people could bookmark this page and keep it as I want to remember the weather uh, of this day because this is the weather where I met uh, this uh, wonderful person, and I want to remember all the the weather when we had a wonderful chat on a bench in a park let's say. So there's a way to preserve uh, information elegantly to make it flow and to make it uh, bookmarkable in the future and to preserve the content instead of forgetting the content. Then there's all the big chunk that we had in the message, HTML, CSS, uh, JavaScript. What is important here when you think about it and uh, about all the things you will carry in that message with HTTP is uh, how easy your, uh, how do you structure your content inside this document? If you put everything like their websites, if you deactivate JavaScript, for example, you will get a blank page and you will tell me, but who they deactivate JavaScript? In fact, more and more people. Uh, if we uh, check uh, the, the statistics of what browsers are receiving the, the user's uh, behavior, more and more users are deactivating JavaScript because they are more and more privacy conscious. They are more afraid of uh, the, the viruses and they are more afraid about the tracking. And so many people will either put uh, ad blockers which will cut some JavaScript or even deactivate JavaScript. So the, when this is happening, they reach a page which is basically dead, which is wild, because there's only the a a JavaScript line in the in the in the markup we have seen, and the site is supposed to be generated dynamically by getting the information from databases or static files and so on. So. When you create a website which is like this, you make already your resistance to time and uh, your uh, uh, and the information it contains very very weak. It becomes your website becomes very uh, uh, likely to become rusty or disappear. So let's talk about how do we how to do better? How do we think about uh, information uh, resilience? Your strategy is to think about your website in a way that it will not perish. It will not disappear. You think about the when you create at the stage, and here I'm talking about people who are in UX, people who are even doing uh, the business deal with the client at the beginning. Think about managing the information obsolescence. It's not about just creating a website for the moment, but think how you will deal with an information which at a point in time will become obsolete or will become interesting, but not at the same level, but the now. Interesting for reference. So you, you, you need to start to think about uh, the strategies to preserve that. So unique URLs are a very good way to, to do that. You, how many times when you write a blog post or an article, or you want to send a reference to someone, you will reach for the Wikipedia page about like, let's say a movie or a place, when in fact there's the, 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 the information about the, the thing on the, the original website. Let's say, I don't know, like, uh, let's say there's a tourist information website about uh, something in, uh, in Tokyo and you're more likely to go fetch the information from the Wikipedia. If you write a blog post, for example, 
you're more likely to go fetch the information from Wikipedia than this uh, tourist website because you will know that in a couple of years, this tourist website, the information you're talking about will disappear. It will have been modified or it will be elsewhere in the website, but the, the URL, URL will have been broken. And that's bad. So when you do a website and it doesn't preserve uh, the content, basically you, you destroy the trust for user. It's important to create the trust. And plus the trust um, for your website, it's part of the stability of your brand. Instead of linking to Wikipedia, the people could link on your pages on your website. It gives a, a better ranking. It has a benefit to bring back people to your website instead of having the fear of losing them. Another way to, uh, to make your content more resilient, it's right. So some content is a, as a, have a copyright, but you're not, it's, it's, it's not mandatory to make a st uh, strong uh, right. It's better to authorize people to copy the content because when you create a, a, a copyright, uh, if you give a license to the content, which is more permissive, like for example, a Creative Commons license, you enable duplication. You enable the possibility of your content living in other spaces. And this is a benefit because it makes the information more resilient. It makes the information flow across websites. What is so resistant about the information about uh, books? We, uh, we have books, uh, all books at home. Like if I take a copy of the Little Prince uh, book and I shred it, uh, in conference, I would do that. I would have bought a, a copy of uh, the Little Prince from Saint-Exupéry and I would have shredded it on stage. And usually you would have <coughs> people like uh, panicking, uh, panicking uh, because I had uh, the, the audace to, uh, to, uh, to shred a book. The Little Prince book is in millions and millions of copies across the world, across languages, everywhere in the world. Me destroying one copy of The Little Prince will not affect at all the quality of the information with regard to this book or will not destroy uh, the uniqueness of this book. Still, when we are dealing with websites, we let that happen all the time. We shred websites all the time. They disappear and there's a unique copy. So one property of the book, which is uh, amazing, is that it's the duplication and the distribution. The book is resistant, not because it's a book and it's paper, it's because it's duplicated in many, many copies and across the world. So that's something which is interesting to think about websites. How do you make your website more resilient by allowing more copies across the world? And finally, something uh, uh, that you need to think about your website, is it archivable? And archivable in the sense of you can retrieve the information. Like what I was mentioning before, where you use a JavaScript framework where there's only one line, if you archive the HTML of this website, you will not get the content. You will get just the archive of the JavaScript line calling the framework. So how do you make the website archivable where the content is really here and can be used for a long time? Websites will become non-maintained. They will change. They will not be working anymore. Your framework, your JavaScript framework, uh, you can go through, for example, um, 
the project uh, webarchive.org, which is archiving websites uh, online, it's a real issue. Like uh, to have a static copy of a website, it's sometimes very hard because it's not always uh, possible through a dedicated uh, a client. So you need to think about that. If you create a, a website which has a lot of uh, social aspect and users interaction, like let's say a, a website like uh, Instagram or let's say uh, uh, any website where you have an activity of collecting things, creating content, does your website has a feature to export all the data? How the users will manage their nostalgia? How do they will manage to the, 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 the fact that they want to keep a copy? The day uh, your uh, startup is uh, bailing out for any reasons, it didn't work. What's happening for the, uh, the data of the users? How long the users will have to export gigabytes of uh, data uh, to keep the content? How many things will you break online uh, by uh, making this website disappear? Like for example, something which has been super interesting in the past, uh, which was uh, done by um, Stamen uh, Design, a studio which was working with MAP and they decided to stop their activities. Everything they did around the map is still available, is still online, and all the work they did is still accessible for people. They decided to stop their activities, but they decided to make and develop everything in a way that it would still be possible to use the content. So that, that's it uh, for what I had to, uh, to say uh, today. I will probably write uh, a blog post with uh, the content of the, the presentation because someone asked, uh, will there be a copy uh, of the presentation? Yes, everything I do is a creative comment, so you can use it, you can copy, you can steal, you can uh, uh, take it. The pictures are mine, so there's no issue. Uh, and uh, you can uh, reach me also through, uh, through my email address. And uh, the address of the website is at the, at the bottom. And I'm happy to take questions if you have any, uh, if you're not bored or if, you're, uh, or if you fell asleep, like someone was in bed, so maybe like... Uh... <laughs> cool. Thank you so much, Carl. Um, so... As I was speaking, mentioned, this is right now we have some time for discussion. So I encourage you guys to send your message or your feedback. I think the feedback will be much appreciated in the chat as well. Um, and we already have a first question from Lena. Um, Carl, do you want me to read it or can you read it? No, I can, I can read it. I have my okay. glasses, so it's okay. <laughs> uh... Oh, I would probably just write it because when we uh, we have people watching it afterwards on yeah. YouTube, they won't yeah. have an access to the chat. So uh, Lena's question is thinking specifically about site redesigns that break existing permalinks instead of site shutting down. Do you think it's more of an awareness problem or incentive problem? As in, do a lot of developers simply not know about maintaining URLs or do they think it's too much work? Okay. Uh, hello, Lena. Long time no see. Uh, so I think it's um, there's both the, the, the web industry is uh, so much a right race sometimes specifically for website uh, agencies where uh, everyone is trying to uh, to get the lower price with the, the client and there's never a discussion. It's very rare. Uh, and I've been working in web agencies in the past. So um, it's very rare there's a discussion at the initial phase about the maintenance of the website. Like who's responsible for maintaining the website? If the website doesn't respect the specs, who will pay for fixing the work? 
And uh, right now at Mozilla, I'm working in web compatibility and uh, we, we, uh, we have that all the time, like uh, all JavaScript libraries are not updated and breaking, breaking uh, websites, breaking browsers because they, they use uh, old technologies. And for, for the specific uh, thing about redesign breaking website, I think it's people not at all thinking that the content uh, could be interesting. Nobody thinks about the nostalgia of a website. Nobody thinks about uh, uh, the, the fact that people might be interested by keeping information. And, it, and there are ways uh, to, to talk about it. Like if you talk, if you, if you have difficulties, uh, if you, people think you're a bit philosopher uh, or poet, uh, talking about the nostalgia of, uh, of uh, the, the, the website, the better way to talk about it in a more business way is like uh, uh, branding, trust, uh, persistence on uh, bringing users back to your uh, to your website, and so on and so on. Thank you for your answer, Carl. Um, yeah, great answer. Thank you. Um, question for me as well. You mentioned um, the examples of not cool URLs. <laughs> with our meetup event <laughs> address um can you give any examples of the good urls like because like you know it's really difficult maybe to secure a good url because i sometimes feel all the good urls are taken and we have to choose only from something that is already existing in the market so it i i think the what makes a good uh, url is something which uh, lasts for a very long time in fact the What's written in the URL is not that important. The important is that it doesn't change. And because of, uh, of the time, uh, it, will, uh, it will become preeminent. Like there's something there. Um, I don't know if people know the, the, the work of, uh, just, uh, I think it's Jessica Lange, the photographer, one of the photographers during the uh, American crisis in uh, 19. Uh, uh, 24, we see our work all the time. There were many photographers at, bit, at this time uh, taking pictures. Why do we see her work specifically more than others? Copyright. The, it was uh, uh, the, the photos she was taking were made for the government. It was free of uh, copyright. The, the work has been copied and copied and copied and published and published and published again and assessed her uh, legacy uh, over time. So for your eyes, if you have, uh, so let's, uh, let's not talk about copyright, but if you have uh, something which is stable as a, as a link, it will, it will uh, and you expect to, to keep it for a very long time, it will become something that will be permanent. It will become something that people will have trust and a reference. And so like there are websites, like uh, for example, so um, I've been working for W3C, the World Wide Web Consortium uh, a couple of years ago. And um, most, if not all the links there are still valid since the beginning. So the way the, it's, it's, uh, the way the WFC is doing is that they put all the content behind what is called a dated space. A dated space is that you introduce dates inside the URL. So people are often, confu uh, it's confusing at the beginning for people because they think that is that has something meaningful of the, the time, the, 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 of the, the meaning of the content. Like for example, on this date, you should have this content and uh, when I was talking about the weather forecast uh, that makes perfect sense to put a date inside the, the URL for this specific date because it's related to time but you don't have to be related to time on blogs we publish content which could be published this today or in one month and the content would be the same. It's not necessarily related to that. And still it has the debt in the, inside, the, inside the URL. And this makes it very practical because that 
is a, the the arrow of time is continuous. You like tomorrow it will be a different date, different time, and so on and so on. So if you introduce a date, you're sure that all your URLs will be unique. You could be uh, very careful and use uh, integer, like uh, integer number. You uh, you start with one, two, three, four, and you build like this. It's the way uh, Instagram and uh, uh, Instagram, Twitter, and all these uh, people are doing by using numbers that they grow uh, little by little to have a, a unique identification. Oh, Daniel. Bonjour, Daniel. <laughs> Well, um, thank you. Let me read a question from Daniel. Um, how do you feel about pages where the URL doesn't change, but the content has to? For example, documentation for a fast change in technology or a page showing the latest COVID-19 statistics. Including a change log is extra work and potentially confusing for users. Are such pages still cool? So. Uh, it's a bit like the weather forecast I was uh, talking about uh, today. So it's, it's why I was saying like at, at a point like for your people in UX, it's your time to understand what is HTTP and what can provide, uh, but HTTP is a toolbox for you to design and create a user experience, which is useful for the user. So for uh, be the COVID or the time and things like everything which has where you need statistics, you need fresh statistics for, and something easy to remember to go. And at the same time, you might need a place for the archive of this, uh, of this, uh, of a specific day, for the data of a specific day. Uh, so it's cool to have uh, a short name for the, uh, the, the, the idea of the day, like for example, slash waiver slash Tokyo or slash Tokyo slash COVID. And you will have the statistic for the COVID for today. And you can either create a link in the page to uh, something which is dated, or you can make a, a automatic redirect to the latest uh, uh, version of the data, which is dated and with the possibility of navigating through the data. There, there are many strategies to do that, where you can, at the same time, preserve the now and give access and preserve the yesterday or the past. You, can, you could even create your URLs for the future, like, you could, like for things which are, have really a date. You could prepare all the URLs for the, for the time to come. I don't know if uh, Daniel, uh, it, uh, yes, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Carl. And uh, also in the beginning, you mentioned that, uh, for example, if you don't take care of the website, sometimes you might come later, right? And you see the uh, spam uh, robots are taking over your website. So I have a question. Do you think they're like a corpse sweepers, corpse cleaners, just, uh, you know, checking all over the internet? And how do they determine that your website is already old and it's, it's actually a time to take it over. So it's easy. Like the way the, the, the spammer do is uh, there's a something, there's a, a service which is called who, who is, which gives the information about your domain name, who owns the domain name, when it has been created, when the next update will be. Because there's a, one of the big issues on, the, on, the, on the, the web is that you, you do not own a domain name, you rent it. Like you have to renew the lease of owning this domain name. So there's a debt, there's a parental debt, uh, like a debt where it's, it's finishing your lease. And so the, yes, there are sweepers which look at these debts. They have big list of debts with domain names. And if the person doesn't renew the, the, the domain name, the domain name becomes available again. It's time to take over. So that's one technique. Another technique is phishing in the sense of uh, you send to a user who's not uh, very knowledgeable. Uh, the person has bought a domain name, but the person is not very knowledgeable about the technology and they uh, send an email 
like uh, you have to renew your website or your your domain name you have to uh, transfer your domain name blah 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 and people uh, click and uh, they get on <laughs> You're very knowledgeable about these things. <laughs> Thank you. Um, cool, we have just a couple of minutes left. So if you guys have any extra last questions or feedbacks, uh, feel free to send them to Coral. And uh, do not hesitate to send me an email if you're uh, too shy or anything, like I'm happy to, uh, to answer. Sometimes I can take a bit of time to answer, but I will answer, that's for sure, so. <laughs> Uh, is there any way also to put some comments on your blog post as well? So I don't have commenting system on my blog post. And it's uh, on purpose for two reasons, because I don't want to spend my time managing spam. That's one reason. <laughs> the second reason is that um, I've always been in the, in the belief that uh, if I don't have comment, people can create blogs to talk about things they see online. And it promotes the fact that you should have a blog and you should write about things online. I don't you think if people uh, create some kind of discussion uh, on your blog, it will give you an idea for the next blog post? <laughs> yes, but uh, you can do that also through inter-blog. Like, uh, for example, in the French community, we have a, a French community uh, active and we are always like talking about the, the blog of the others and uh, referring and uh, having a threads of discussion sometimes on uh, over weeks and weeks but uh, it's like a flu it's like a, a comment like a comment is a small blog post put it on your blog <laughs> um there's also one small thing that i just remembered um for social media uh, I think that they came up with an idea how to preserve, for example, accounts of people who passed away, right? And yeah. what do you do with this account, right? How yeah, do you like, yeah. you can't delete them, right? Because it's like memory for people. So it's a, it's a very, very difficult topic in, the, in terms of the digital world. And uh, specifically because the, the information you, you produce on a, on the social network is the information which belongs to a company. So it's not yours. Like it's not like your belongings uh, where you give them uh, when you die and you give them to you, you pass them to your family, your children, your, uh, your, uh, your direct family. And, um, and in the, in the, in the physical world, we have something which is a, uh, uh, very organized and it's like we have notaries uh, which are handling uh, the like the will or uh, there's a, a system of laws to to take care of that the digital world is just at the beginning of that maybe maybe we can imagine in a couple of years the notaries who are uh, uh, handling properties titles and uh, and belongings when you have a fortune like which is not the majority of people or when uh, and uh, you have something to transmit um, maybe the digital identities will be part of that and it's why i was saying it's like all these social networks and things should provide a way to have data export so when you're dead it's a bit too late but there might be a way where you could you could have on the on this website uh, 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 a way to to give your legacy to someone else for example um, this french community i was talking about uh, in the past we were talking about uh, okay if i die who's uh, who's being able to maintain my website for example who do i give access and so we uh, organize a couple of people to say it's like oh you have access to my website and i have access to yours and if one of us die, it's, uh, the website is, uh, can be manageable. Another way to think about it is that if you think that the, um, uh, the content of the website is uh, important and, uh, and uh, good for, uh, for the knowledge, you start to make archives of this website on other websites. And that's why I was talking about duplication and the resistance of information, because as soon as you start, you, you allow the possibility for people to duplicate your content, you make it more resilient, you disappear, but the content still live. 
it's a, it's a bit the principle of uh, 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 open source uh, and code where with the license authorize a copy and if the maintainer doesn't maintain anymore the, the project, some people can take over. So the summary is, if you make in a final will, please don't forget to mention <laughs> the legacy over your website. Yes. <laughs> uh, cool. So with that note, uh, if we have no other questions, uh, I'm going to wrap up the event. <laughs> Thank you so much, Carl. Uh, it was really cool. It was very inspiring. And Thank you very yeah. much for uh, <laughs> inviting me. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing information. Uh, I will make sure it will be distributed and stolen and, uh, you know, <laughs> it will cool. go to masses. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, you have a Carl context here and his website. So uh, feel free to send uh, the messages uh, as he stated. So he gave you the concept uh, and yeah. Uh, it was nice to have you all for a nice discussion. Uh, have a great evening for those who are joining us from Japan and Asia and have a great uh, morning for Stephen who is joining us from Colombia who has 5 a.m. right now. I remember it. Thank you, Stephen, for coming. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone, Carl. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.